Welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. We have a very special guest. Her name is Karen Holton. She's uh, an ET and, an ET and angelic experiencer, uh, an exopolitical ambassador, uh, a holistic coach, and a channel. And uh, her professional experiences include shamanic guidance, awakening and ascension counseling, as well as public discourses. Uh, she has two podcasts, and um, I'll leave it at that. At the that is the introduction for now. Uh, welcome to tonight's show, Karen. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, so, let me see if my that's interesting. All right, let me turn on a little more light. My light was really perfect, and then all of a sudden dimmed. All right, let me get some more light. Sorry about this. Nope, that's okay. It is, there we go. There we, whoops. <laughs> All right, that's fine. So, um, go to the very first event in your life, which was odd or uh, strange or out of the ordinary. It could be any age and it could be any topic as long as it's strange and interesting to talk about? Well, um, I think one thing that I, uh, when I was a child, I was very aware that there were other beings around me, but I couldn't see them, but I knew that they were there. I didn't understand what that was about at the time. And then um, when I was about, oh, I don't know, maybe like really young, like maybe four years old, I remember I was sitting on the toilet looking at the floor and the floor had uh, black and white checkerboard type tiles on it. And I remember sitting there and kind of, I don't know why, but all of a sudden I noticed that one little corner looked like it was moving. And so I concentrated on it. And the more I concentrated on it, the more it started to move. And it became like very much like waves rolling the way, it, you know, waves in the ocean would roll, you know, come up to the beach. Very similar to that. And I thought it was really cool. And so I just kept doing that and doing that. And then all of a sudden, I don't know, I just dropped it from my attention. Everything went back to normal. And um, I didn't think anything about it. When you're a kid, you don't know that that stuff isn't normal or isn't natural until people tell you that it's not, you know. So, of course, my family said, don't talk about that stuff and don't tell anybody or they're going to think you're crazy. Um, another thing that happened is oh, I had a brother. Oh, before you go on to the next thing. So go back. Um, the You were looking at a uh, black and white tile floor. Yeah. Okay. Describe the movement again. Well, I noticed that in the far corner, it looked like what we would consider now, like kind of a pixelation. Something was just a little weird about it. And I focused my attention on it. And the more I focused my attention on it, the more it looked like the tiles were starting to form like waves. Like the floor was no longer flat. It started to form waves. And, the, and then I found that I could encourage it just from my will, and it actually started forming all of these rolling uh, waves on the floor. So, and Go ahead. And then I dropped my attention from it, and it all went flat back normal again. So thinking back on it, I'm sure you've thought about this event many times because it was the first strange thing that happened to you. No, uh, I actually didn't. I don't think about this stuff at all unless someone asks me. Then I then I, then I remember, but no, not really. I don't really think about it that much. I, I don't know. I can't explain what happened. Well, I, I'm not asking you to explain it. What I'm trying to do is get an idea of what conclusion you came to in your mind about what you think it was in even in a vague sort of it could be this or this or this you know did you did you extrapolate the possibilities in your mind at all ever after that no i never even thought about it until actually about six months ago when somebody else uh rex bear from leak project he asked me the same question 
And uh, I no, I never thought about it. My whole life has got all kinds of weird stuff happening, happened in it. And I was always cautioned, don't talk about it. People are going to think you're crazy. You're imagining it. You have an overactive imagination. You know, that kind of thing. Okay, we'll go on to your next experience then. Well, um, the other thing is I had an older brother, four years older than me, and he was pretty mean. mean. And uh, one thing he used to do is, is lock me in the closet. And I was actually able to remote view outside the room, outside of the closet door. So I could still see what was going on in the room. And what happened is when I told him and the rest of my family, they just belittled me and humiliated me to the point that I went, you know what? Maybe I maybe I do have an overactive imagination. Maybe I'm imagining it. I don't know. I couldn't expl- I couldn't explain it. What did you see again? Say it one more time. I saw okay, so I'm I'm locked in a closet. Right. And it's completely dark in there. Right. But right. I could see through the door by what we now would call, I didn't know anything about this at the time, but what we now call remote viewing, I was able to see what was going on in the room. Okay, so yeah, I I wouldn't call that remote viewing. I would call it um, your third eye opening up because I've I don't I've, know I've um, like for instance I was listening to uh, I was listening to some uh, hemisphere hemisync uh, stuff mm-hmm. and, from Robert Monroe's Gateway and I had my eyes closed and I could. Even though my eyes were closed, I could see the room exactly like it was normally mm-hmm. if I had my eyes open, but my eyes were mm-hmm. closed. And I thought my eyes were open. It looked so normal. So I I got up and I started to walk across the room, but I still had my head connected with headphones to a, to a uh, tape player that was sitting there next to me. And I was like, oh, I'm I'm, I'm not with my eyes open and and you know I didn't even realize I had a headphone at that point headphones so my point is that it was a psychic vision of the room and mm-hmm. my guess is that you were psychically seeing what was in the room does that sound well, yeah sure and um like I said so my family was just really really uh, it humiliated me anytime I mentioned anything. So I just stopped. Um, I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought there was something wrong with having these kind of experiences. And then as I started to grow older, I started going to church, different churches. And um, every time I tried to talk to someone about what I was experiencing, oh, my God, it was like, you can't, you know, you that's the devil. Those are demons. You can't, you know, there's, you know, you have to stick close to religion. And, you know, and it just everything um, was basically I was gaslit to the point where I super suppressed everything. And even though I had experiences, I just pretended that there was something wrong with me, that it wasn't real. And somehow I was imagining those things. And um, and so I stuck close to religion. And then um, it wasn't until, oh, I guess the early 1990s. And at that point, I was done with religion. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. If it works for people, great. But I realized that because I've been to a lot of religions and a lot of churches, and I realized that, um, you know, that there's nothing wrong with me. And it was after that that I had the angelic experience. Well, go to your next. Uh, go to your next uh, odd experience. Well, um, so that would be the angelic experience, and um, it came at a very, very difficult time in my life. Um, I was um, divorced from my husband. I was a single parent with two kids, and I was finding it because. Basically, I had been a Jehovah Witness for 17 years. All my community was the Jehovah Witnesses. When I left, that's a shunning organization. So they tell you you're dead. You're dead to them and and you're dead to God. So you have no community. And and when when you become a Jehovah Witness, you have to give up all your so-called worldly friends because they're all Satan worshipers and you can only... Um, associate with Jehovah Witnesses. So after 17 years, that was my complete community, including my mother, uh, who then thought that I was a Satan worshiper because I left. 
and um, and it's just the way they think. And so uh, it was a very difficult time for me. So I was dealing with, you know, financial issues, you know, um, adjusting to a completely different reality. And um, my husband and I were uh, divorced and um, and I was just having trouble coping. So he he um, um, put a lot of pressure on me to let the kids go and stay with him. And he promised me he would never keep them from me. And, you know, he'd take good care of them and they'd be better off because I was a terrible mother. Well, looking back, I wasn't really a terrible mother, but, you know, I was under a lot of stress and um, and maybe didn't make the best of decisions all the time. Anyway, so the children went to live with him and then he cut me off and it devastated me. It devastated me uh, and rocked me to my core and I could not cope without my children because I love them and miss them so much. And uh, there was other stuff too. My mom was putting a lot of pressure on me because she believed I was demonized and all the church members that I could no longer communicate with, you know, put a lot of pressure and, you know, that I was demonized and that I shouldn't see my children because I was unfit because of leaving the religion. So anyway, long story short, I decided to off myself and this is a very strange sort of a paranormal tie-in. The way I was going to off myself was in a very specific way that I probably wouldn't have thought of on my own. What I think happened, because I found out two years later um, from a woman that I had met, she knew another woman whose son had committed suicide in the same, in the same home, in the same uh, um, uh, house that I was renting. And he did it in a very specific way. And it was interesting that this came into my mind to off myself in the very same way. But at that time, I didn't know it. I just was going to off myself and it seemed like the best way to do it. So um, um, I think what happened is I was in such a low vibrational state that uh, a, a, a huge state of grieving that I think that I tapped into the energy of this guy who had offed himself because obviously he was in a very bad state or he wouldn't have offed himself. So um, that's what I think in retrospect. But anyway, so I was going to off myself. And then that night I had this angelic visitation and I didn't see like a, a man in robes with wings. It wasn't like that at all. Um, I could hear um them talking to me and when I say them it's because it was like a thousand voices all speaking in perfect unison as one voice and I saw visually um, like a thousand points of light and the light was flashing out the sides which gave the illusion of wings and that's why I call this my angelic experience they didn't say we are angels sent from God they didn't say that they just asked me you know, why I, you know, they said, first of all, they said, if you want to um, leave your life, you can do that. There are exit points because life is never really meant to be that terrible. But if you decide to stay, we'll give you a gift. That's what they said to me. And um, I said, well, I don't really want to off myself, but I, I need to have a better life. I was 42 years old at the time. And I said, I'm just tired of all the crap, you know, uh, how much are you supposed to, you know, this is not what life is supposed to be like. And, um, and they said, well, like I said, they said, if you want to stay, we'll give you a gift. And I said, oh, my gosh, I don't know what to ask for. I mean, who gets who gets um, visitation from angels? Who gets that? I mean, you know, you hear about it in the Bible and stuff, but I never knew anyone that had an experience like this. And it was a very, very real experience. I was not under the influence of anything besides my grief. And um, I said, I need to think about this. And they said, well, when you're ready, you just let us know because we're always around you. And we always know what's going on, but you need to ask for the help that you need. And I said, okay. And the next day, uh, I felt a little better and uh, I went out and started going for long walks and thinking about things because I was trying to think, what do I want? What do I want for my gift? And I thought, okay, I could ask for a lot of money. That would sure solve a lot of issues. And I went, nope, I, it just didn't feel right. And then I said, 
I thought, well, maybe, you know, if I had a, a strong, healthy partner, that might help. And I went, nope, that's not it either. And I thought, well, maybe if I was famous and everybody loved me, my life would be better. And I went, nope, that's not it either. And I kept thinking and thinking. And then it just came to me that I needed to ask for wisdom. And so I asked for wisdom. And the funny thing is, is I'm very naive, I guess, because I thought they would just pour the wisdom into me. But it didn't work like that at all. The way I got wisdom was through going through real life challenges. But the difference was I always knew how to fix the problem or get out of trouble because I always had this link to to these beings that I can communicate with. And even to this day, um, they're never far from me. So I can just ask in my mind or out loud, I need help with this, or I'm not sure about that. I'm not feeling very good about this. And it just comes to me. It just comes to me. And it's always a really good solution. It's never... Um, you know, a bad solution. And so that's sort of how that happened. And I never had a, an experience like that since. But after that, I went through some terrible stuff. You and I talked a little bit off camera about some of the stuff I'd been through. I never would have gotten through any of that um, or the life I have today, which is a very good life, if I hadn't had that angelic experience. And I don't believe I had it because I'm any kind of a righteous person. I think it just came to me because that's really what I needed at the time. And I've always, um, at that point, I was very open to being a channel. I didn't know what it was called at the time, but I was very open to uh, communication with other beings at that time and from then, since then till now. And, um, and if, I don't think I would have had the extraterrestrial experience if I hadn't had the angelic experience first. So that's sort of it in a nutshell. Uh, thank, thank you for you sharing. For sharing. Um, um, so go to your next interesting experience. Well, like I said, after that, I had, you know, a lot of challenges in my life, but I had a lot of opportunities that I can't explain. Um, I ended up... Um, um, getting into um, college and then university and ending, ended up getting a university degree, even though I'm a very poor reader. I have uh, very low uh, reading comprehension skills and, and concentration skills. And I was able to do that. Um, but then after that, I got sick and, and then I had a botched surgery and I've been putting my life together uh, back together ever since. So as well, I was recovering from that that I had what I call my ET experience. Now, I want you to know that I'm filtering my experience through myself and from my own understanding. And so I don't know if technically these are extraterrestrials or if technically those were angels. And I think even, I don't think there's a lot of division even. I think there's a lot of overlap, in, you know, in these experiences. But anyway, so then it was around um, 2012 that I was working on recovering. And it, I, it was a really tough time. Um, I was paying off my debts and, and with very little income. I didn't have enough money for food and rent. It was a very tough time. I was out collecting, bo uh, you know, wine bottles and pop bottles, trying just trying to so I could just eat. Right. It was a pretty tough time. But at the same time, I did. I got all my debts cleared, all completely cleared. And I was always working on getting my health back and, um, and you know, meditating and, and just doing things like that. So anyway, then what happened in about 2012 is I woke up one morning and I had the most adventure I could ever imagine in one night's sleep. It didn't make sense. I, I thought for sure I was dreaming. But I went to bed that the next night and I had more adventures and I woke up in the morning. So I would go to bed in my bed, go to sleep, and in the morning, I would wake up in my bed, but I would have this vast memory of, of these adventures. And when I dream, often um, my dreams are sort of disconnected and things like feeling like you're running and you're not going anywhere. And, you know, my dreams don't make a lot of sense, but this made absolute perfect sense it was like a memory it wasn't like a dream so then of course I thought I was crazy anyway for three month period every single night this happened to me and then it stopped and um 
but the experiences I had was like being away three and a half years. So I had a ton of experience um, because the time wherever I, I went to is very, very different than the time we have here on Earth. So uh, that was pretty amazing. And I also got a download at around the same time that I needed to put together a program and make it available to humanity for free. It wasn't to charge anything. It was really clear. I wasn't supposed to start a religion or get follow a following. And I needed to offer this for free. And I call it the Nine Steps to Quantum Health Transformation. And it's available on my website under the free resources tab. And um, I put that together. And it took me two, three years, actually, because I was recovering from brain injury uh, to put that all together. But that happened at the same time. Uh, as far as my ET experiences, um, you know, I, I, I would go to a place that I call the big ship. And it's massive, like there's like probably a million beings there um, and it serves several different functions. But um, um, the really amazing thing about it all is, um, yeah, I'm actually working on a book right now, um, um, you know, describing everything that I saw and experienced. And it was really quite an experience. I also stayed away from uh, all the other people who are claiming to have had ET experiences because I wanted my experience to remain very, um, very uh, clear and my own and not be borrowing from anybody else's ideas. So my experience is quite, quite different than than most people's. But yeah, that's sort of how it, how it happened. So, oh, God, too much light. Anyway, um, let me change my light. Dim this a little bit. Keeps changing because bright, dim, bright, dim. And, uh, keeps. One minute it's bright, the next minute it's dim. And I don't know why it keeps changing. That's anyway. technology. I uh, know well, that was just that's just the window curtains. Mm. So, uh, I had them closed and then it got really dim. That's probably because the sun is going in and out of the clouds. So anyway. Um, You've you had three months of every night being on the big ship, yes? Yeah. Well, we weren't always on the big ship. Like I said, the big ship has about uh oh, I guess four primary purposes. Do you want to hear about them? Uh well, I would say that there's absolutely nothing I don't want to hear about your experiences. <laughs> we could okay. get for three or four days. I'd still be asking for more if you could tell me more. Okay, okay, well, the, there's three primary purposes. So first of all, the beings on the big ship, they don't have a name, they don't speak English, they don't talk. It's all done through telep telepathy. And um, some of them have never even heard of Earth, don't even know that we're here. Some of them do, but they facilitate a certain kind of work. So the people on the big ship are also not a homogenous group. They're from many different dimensional realities. They're from different star systems. They're from all over and they immigrate and sometimes they leave and go to other places. But on, when they're on the big ship, it's very multicultural, which I thought was super interesting. So I got exposed to a lot of different cultures, very different than here on earth. Um, they look very much like us. There are There is um, diversity the way we have diversity amongst the humans. We're all one species, but we are human. We're part of the human race, and they may be from different races, but we're all primarily the same, the same um, species. So that took a lot. That made it so that I was never afraid. You know, I never, I mean, here on Earth, you hear about the Nordics, and then everything else is hideous. Well, that was not my experience, not at all. And, and just like on Earth, we have different skin tones and um, the majority of beings on, on the big ship are actually what we would consider people of color. But some of the tones are a little different than humans. And just like on Earth, you know, people have different shaped ears and different colored eyes and different sized noses and different heights and different weights. Same thing on the big ship. But what was abundantly clear was that they are like our next state of evolution. And so my experiences, the reason I remember is because I'm supposed to share this information because this is where we're going if we want to. And it's based very much 
on what I call the love harmonic. Now, I know you hear a lot about, oh, light and love, light and love. Well, what love is, is not just an emotion or a feeling you get for someone that you care about. Love is so much more. It includes patience. It includes mildness. It includes self-control. It includes so many things. Those are how you actively um, act within love. Love is like a basket of all kinds of what we might consider virtues and uh, positive qualities. So they're very, very um, used to, um, they've been evolved to that point for quite some time. And so they've left, they don't have, okay, I don't know how to explain this any other way, but everything we experience on earth is a construct. It's all been constructed generally to support the ruling class and um, everything, everything from our concept of race, our concept of gender, our concepts of everything, religion, it's all constructed by humans. Well, they're free from all of that. They don't have any of that anymore. So you don't have fear and you don't have insecurities and you don't have, you know, uh, people that are insincere. You don't have any of that. Plus, it's telepathic. So, um, you know, you, I felt incredibly, incredibly safe there so um so these are the basic this is basically the beings and then what they do is they facilitate um the inter uh, what i call the exopolitical work where i'm able to go there without my body etherically and attend meetings and it's the weirdest thing because i'll wake up in the middle of the night because i got to go to the bathroom and i'm totally aware that i'm in one of these meetings and I, at first I would be embarrassed because I didn't want them knowing I'm going to the bathroom. You know, it's, it's kind of private, right? But it doesn't matter to them. And you meet etherically. And I don't remember really all the details of what goes on in those meetings. And I believe that's um, a protection for me that I don't remember. But I definitely know that I go there and I meet with other beings. And they're very interested in my perspective on what it's like to be a human being on earth at this time. And I'm also not the only one. There are apparently millions of human beings who go and participate in this kind of work, but they don't remember. And there's a, there's a whole process to, to not remembering if you want to get into that. But um, that's one thing. Then another thing they do, of course, is they live on the big ship and they, they act as hosts and trainers and they maintain the big ship, which is, by the way, it's very uh, much alive and conscious. It's an organic structure. It's not metal and nuts and bolts or anything like that. And um, so there's that. And then another thing they do is what I call the intergalactic resettlement program. And there's two parts to that. The first part is, and I got to participate in some of this, where we went to different worlds and we did like um, scientific expedition work. So we would be there for a limited time. We had no interaction with the animals. It was just fact finding mission to gather information because there are so many worlds that don't have humanoids. They've got the, they got the you know, aquatic life, they've got all the vegetation, they've got the bugs, they got animals, they got everything, but no, no humanoids. So that was the other thing that I thought was super cool is according to what I learned there, that we are actually created. We were actually created and then we're placed in these different habitats. And what's weird about this is depending on your perspective, you could be a flat earther or you could be a globe earther. And my experience actually fits for both depending on what you believe in. But anyway, so we would go down and do these scientific expeditions, gather the information, come back, because what they want to do is when they resettle people, they want to do it in a way that is going to do the least damage and harm or, ups, or and not upset the ecosystems. So there's a very high value placed on all life in the universe. So that was really cool. And then the second half of that is actually helping folks resettle. And uh, that's very interesting too. So mostly though, I um, am involved in the exopolitical work. And the information that they gather from me and probably millions of other humans and maybe even millions of people from other systems is it goes into some kind of a, a data bank or you know how we have the cloud, something like that. And it's, it's, meant, it's synthesized and it helps them to make decisions on, I don't know, 
whether they want to um, I don't know. I don't even actually know where the information goes, but it's really interesting. And then there's there's all kinds of stuff like I, I could tell you so much about the ship. I could tell you so much about the beings, uh, the culture. But it was such a beautiful experience. I got to tell you, the rub of it is to have to come back and live as a human being. That's the tough part. And, and, and be back into our mainstream society or alternative society and still function. So, of course, for the longest time, I actually thought I was crazy and imagined it. And um, but then in 2017, I got the call that it was time for me to come out and start talking about it, and producing videos. And, um, you know, I can, I actually uh, the first person who ever had me on their show was Augie Nost. And um, and he was very, very encouraging to me. And then Chris Matthew from Forbidden Knowledge News had me on his show and it just all took off from there. And I'm working on the book. I know you probably have lots of questions. I don't know what direction you want me to go in. So that's why I'm going to wait for you to ask me a question. Well, OK, so. Um, I don't know that I have a direction to go f for you in, for you to go in, I think. If you just keep talking, uh, <laughs> like, um, okay, so when you say you went to the ship, where, uh, where do you believe the ship exists? Well, I have a diagram, but I don't really know. Oh, it oh says you talking sure. about the one? You talking about the one where all the uh, spaces overlap? Yes, yeah. exactly. It's a Venn diagram, and that is a very simplistic illustration of where the big ship is and it makes a lot of sense because that's how come um different beings from different places can all or different beings and all that can come and in, into one place and 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 coexist now the other thing too i want to say is we cannot exist apart from earth we were born on the earth we need the natural rhythms of the earth we need you know nighttime and daytime we need the uh, schumann resonance we need all kinds of things for us to be healthy so on the big ship we don't have that and so what they have there are these healing chambers no they're not med beds but um, part of my orientation, by the way, when you go to orientation, you get a buddy. You get someone who stays with you 24-7 to make sure that you're okay, you know, answer questions, um, help help you out in, in a number of ways. So my buddy took me to this, wow, huge, I, I'm only going to call it a room. I'm trying to use language that people will understand, even though it may not exactly fit what I saw. But it's like a huge room, like a huge auditorium, more like a coliseum, huge, huge, huge room. And in it were all of these, what I'm going to call pods, and they open up kind of like a, a, a clamshell. And there's a variety of sizes. So some of them are like six feet long, and some of them are like 30 feet long. I'm assuming they're for giant people. I don't know. I don't know that part. But anyway, so she took me to one and I looked at it and it opened and she motioned for me to to, to go in and lay in there. And I did. And um, and it, the everything is actually organic. This is the weird thing from the from the ventilation system to the cleaning system to uh, producing what we might need in a day. The only thing that's not uh, produced that way is actually the food. The food grows live and in every department. But anyway, getting back to these pods, I noticed that I was laying on what felt like moss, just felt like moss, it was very comfortable. And when the, the lid came down, it was very moist the way, if you took a walk into an ancient forest, there's a moisture and it's full of, you know, all the scents and probably essential oils and things that are coming off the plant. So all of that was happening. I felt so comfortable in there that I fell asleep. And it wasn't that much longer, at least I don't know how long. And, you know, it opened up. And then my buddy, you know, held out her hand and helped me out. And I just felt fantastic. And so these are used before anybody can go down and do the... Um, 
you know, the intergalactic resettlement projects or the scientific expeditions, or even if you want to go to another world, you need to be reconditioned because every system has slightly different oxygen content, different nutrition, you know, in the plants and stuff. Everything is slightly different. They don't have the same Schumann resonance as we have on Earth. And your body needs to be conditioned. And we also needed to be conditioned in order just to be comfortable while we were on the big ship. So I remember you showing the drawing. Uh, I mean, if you wanted to share, you could show it now. But the, the problem with your drawing is that um, even if somebody were to analyze it, it might be fairly difficult for them to wrap their mind around what the space is in the middle that the ship is in. Um, do you have something like in your head that is more simple than than what that drawing represents that that well, like higher dimension or uh, higher than the highest dimension or well, you know, it's whatever? Pretty hard. It's hard to, to wrap your head around it because we've been programmed to think a certain way and to think that things are solid and, and real and all that. But apparently, all the dimensional realities are here. They're all here and they're all now. There isn't the idea of distance and the idea of time doesn't exist. And I think that explains why, you know, we're seeing Bigfoot and we're seeing, you know, crypt, different cryptids and and we're seeing all kinds of different things on Earth because there are, I believe, places where there's there's more overlap into different dimensional realities. And then if you want to think about the multiverse, that gets really complicated, you know, that there is, um, you know, another Earth somewhere else, maybe millions of them. We don't know. I mean, we're a lot of this is theorizing and I don't have, you know, really a good way to explain it. But um Everything exists all at once. There is no such thing really as time or distance once we're able to uh, travel. Let me give you an example. Uh, at one point, they wanted to move the big ship. And what happened was um, there was no traveling. What happened is everybody on the big ship kind of has um, not, really a, not really a holiday, but they have a special day. They eat very lightly on that day, and we all go into a deep meditative state. And when we go into that state, the ship also emits these tones that help us to deeply, deeply relax. And we go into a meditative state. And say we're at point A and we want to go to point B. Point A becomes point B. You don't travel from point A to point B. There's no wormholes, nothing in my experience. It just becomes point B. Okay, so um, that's not inconsistent with what I've heard about um, how aliens get around. Even the, like the greys, how one faction of the greys gets around. It, you know, they, I was told from one of my clients that, who was used as a breeder, um, that they get around because they think that, you know, that they use their mind to just move from space to space. And one thing she told me was that they don't really need a spaceship to move from space, from place to place. They could go from their planet to our planet just by thinking, and they would show up here. But they did need the spaceship not to move with. They used the spaceship to put you on, to take your egg out and take your sperm out and put the two together and breed, use, use you as a breeder. And uh, so the spaceship was for a place to put you on a table and take care of you uh, in reference to using you as a breeder. But if they did weren't doing that breeding process, they could just come and go without the ship. So Yeah, I don't know anything about, like people talk about greys and reptilians and arcturians. I don't know anything about any of those. That's all outside of my experience. So, but this is how, how the big ship was moved. Another thing that's interesting is what powers the big ship? We do, we did, we powered it. So what happens is again, we have a, a day that's like a celebration day where we, um, um, I don't know, the, the tone is kind of, 
not too serious, but fairly serious because it's 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 kind of a spiritual experience. It's not a religious experience. And all of us, we just donate some of our life force to the big ship when it needs more energy. And then we just replenish. So most people, most beings are super healthy, super, super healthy. Like we can't even imagine. You know those old drawings or carvings uh, like from, from um, I don't know, the Assyrian days where they have like um, Enki and Gilgamesh and all that. And it shows them super, these super buff people with the big beards. Well, that's how healthy they are. Most of them are bigger than us. Uh, some are smaller, but and some are around the same size, but most are bigger, very stocky, very muscular, very, very healthy, healthy beings. Well, those beings have no problem uh, donating some of their life force to the big ship. Others, you know, feel a little tired after, and you might want to go and spend some time in the healing pods or the healing, the healing um, chambers. And but you know, we recover very quickly, and so that's actually what powers the big ship. We do. And it's like I said, it's organic. All of it is alive and it's actually conscious. It's pretty, pretty cool. It's very different than a Star Trek uh, experience. There's no no people sitting at these um, desks with all these flashing lights and, you know, they're all doing stuff all the time. There's none of that. Absolutely none of that. It's uh, it's 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 more way more sophisticated than that. And the other thing, too, is it's not like people get up in the morning and go, oh, it's 8 o'clock, my shift starts now. It doesn't work that way either. Because it's telepathic, you know when something needs doing, and you know if you want to go and, and do it or you don't do it. Someone else will do it if you don't do it. And the other thing about the telepathy is um, they, have the, they have the ability to run thought publicly or privately. So they do, they're able to shield their thoughts if that they want privacy or they want to just share with their partner or their children or something like that. They're able to run thought privately as well as publicly. So I would say the biggest challenge to being on the big ship is uh, to learn how to calm, it was to learn how to calm my mind because I get all excited and all kinds of thoughts are popping into my mind. It's pretty noisy. But they're able to shield their children as well, which I think is a super good thing because, you know, they got beings coming and going from all over the place and they're very, very, very protective of their children. So, um, yeah, so I thought that was pretty cool. There's no there's no schedule. I mean, yes, we do get into a pattern or a rhythm when we all go to sleep. They don't have night and day there. But, you know, where we would go to sleep similar times, get up similar times. And, uh, yeah. There's a, a lot of its education, a lot, a lot of its education. So so all of your nighttime experiences were all automatic. You didn't have to do anything. I didn't do anything. They contacted me. Same with the angel. They contacted me. I didn't contact them. I never in a million years would have thought I was good enough for such an experience to be contacted, you know? And, um, you know, so, yeah, they contacted me and uh, initiated it. And then um, often people don't remember, and the reason they don't remember is for their own safety. It's very difficult to come back and, and, and to go from that very utopian society back to what's going on on Earth. Sure opens your eyes when you see what's going on on Earth and you compare the two. So uh, did you have any experiences beyond the ship? That were not part yes. of the Yep. Um, I don't have full recall, but I have quite a bit. One time we went down, and um, each team that goes down, they take turns um, deciding, you know, what, how, where we're going to sleep, you know, setting up the habitat. Sometimes we took tents. Sometimes we could build, you know, ba a basic structure, depending on the climate and the weather and everything else. And... Um, Sorry, I'm a bit distracted by your yawning. Well, that's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not sorry you're to, tired. I'm not supposed anyway. to be on the camera. I yawn all the time. It's, uh -huh. it's a lack of oxygen. Part of it's a lack of oxygen. Uh, yeah. But it's not because you're boring me. It's just Okay, well, that's good to know. <laughs> that's it's good just to know. me. That's it's good not, to know. It's not you. 
OK, it's not you, it's me. Um, so anyway, so we went down and it was very much like, um, you know, northern, I would say like the, the um, what it's like in like northern uh, California, you know, a lot of trees and stuff. And we stick to a confined area because somehow we're able to keep ourselves hidden. I don't know the details on that. But the trees were super tall and the bark was super dark, like almost black. And there was green foliage at the top, same as what you would see, you know, on Earth. And um, I can remember we were going through the woods. And we have these things that I'm going to call tablets. They're very much like a, a tablet that we would use here on Earth, but there's no frame to it. It's kind of looks like it's made out of like some kind of glass or plexiglass or something like that, oblong. And it has sort of a little bit rounded corners. There's no dials. There's no... Uh, place for a charger nothing like that it just looks like a, a, a clear sheet but we're able to take it around and it would scan all kinds of like the plants and bugs and we did not have any interaction with animals for some reason i don't know exactly why but we were not we were kept separate from the animals because um i guess it's um, less disruptive to be around plants and bugs and you know the odd aquatic creature than to be around things that would be like their version of buffalo or something like that so they really wanted us to have leave no imprint that we had even been there it was really important so the ecology and the health of the biosphere and everything is super important that i do remember anyway so this one time this is one weird thing because we didn't have any contact with the animals so this makes no sense to me but I, I, was, I heard this sound that was kind of like an animal crying out. I looked up and there was this little creature up in the tree and it looked like it was in distress. And I held out my, my arms and I said, come on, come on down to me. And it actually flew down. It had like butterfly wings and it looked a little bit like a cross between a cat and a monkey. And it wasn't very big. It was like maybe about this, this, this long is all it was. And it flew down in my arms and I was tickled pink and I carried it back. We were staying in these like little makeshift cabins and I just put it down on a cot. And I don't remember what happened after that, but it doesn't make any sense to me because we didn't have contact with the animals. So I don't know if it was someone's pet or what. I have no idea. And that was pretty cool. So how many planets did you, how many planets did you go to? I don't know. I think quite a few, but I only specifically remember going to two. And the other one that I went to, it had these amazing um, hot springs and the water would come out into these rocky caverns. And so after a day of, I do remember um, when we were eating the food that was on the planet. And I remember we, I was eating this thing. It was like a big, a big melon and the inside was, was like what a fresh, what a fresh, fig would be like inside it was very very delicious i remember that and we all were eating together and afterwards we went to these um these hot springs and we were just soaking in the hot springs and it was just so so lovely and w what was weird too is when we looked up there there was two planets one was really big and moved super slow and one was really small and it went super fast and to this day i couldn't tell you which was farther away or closer like I had nothing to compare it with to know, you know, really anything. But it was really interesting. So I remember that as well. So those are two examples. But I, I know I went to a lot more than that. I really liked it. Like I said, I was there for what we would consider like three and a half years. But in my time, it happened only at night and for three months. So you... Um, so... Let's say you were at the ship, but not in the ship. You were outside the ship and you looked at the ship. Would the ship be existing in uh, a reality that is consistent with our reality or would it be in a yeah. space that's... Yeah, it definitely looked physical. I only have one memory of seeing it from the outside and I'm not sure if it was because we we're coming back from an expedition or what I don't know I honestly don't know but I saw the ship from the outside and it was very interesting it uh it looked like 
a sphere that was squashed down from the top and up from the bottom. So it kind of was flattened on the top and the bottom. So if you took, um, I don't know, a balloon and you kind of pushed it, you know, that's what it looked like. And it had like arms that came out, um, not exactly like an octopus, more like, you know, the arms of a galaxy, that kind of thing that came out. And that's where all the ships um, would dock. And I another and so that's the only time I ever saw it from the outside and it appeared black to me and the background also appeared black, but we were able to see it. I don't know why. I don't know uh, <clears throat> really much more than that. And then an offshoot of that is another experience I remember, <clears throat> excuse me, is when um, I was on my way with a bunch of other people. I call them people because I'm telling you they're people. There was even no shock in the beginning seeing them. But um, so we had to go down to the docking bay. And <clears throat> because the ships are so big, there's like vast distances even within the ship. So we were at the edge looking down and the docking bay was below. And it was quite a, a distance, like I'd say like a kilometer, maybe even two kilometers down, quite far. And so what people did was they just stepped off the ledge and something captured us so that we didn't fall. I don't know what, something invisible. And there was two, two um, rails on either side, similar to, you know, when you're getting out of a swimming pool and you're holding onto those metal, um, the steps, and then there's, it kind of goes up and then over. Sure. Yeah, like that, except they weren't fat like that. They were very thin. And I realized that by depending on how tight I, I held them is how fast I would go down. And I, I loved it. So I just tried to make it go as fast as I could. So I'm falling very quickly. And the woman that was waiting after me to get on, she jumped on, but she was head first so that we were head to head. But, but you know, like I would say like a city block apart from each other, right? And I'm whipping down this thing. And she comes whipping down after me and she's chasing me. And she's, she's playing. She's just playing, right? There's no threat or anything. And both of us are just giggling like girls, and screaming on the way down the way you would if you were on a roller coaster and when you get to the bottom there's no impact there's just kind of a little poof and then you step off it's just super super slick so um the experience of getting off the ship and getting down to the planet that one time was that uh the way you got to the planets all the time or did you ever go down in in like smaller ships or how to I don't know. I honestly don't know. But I, I'm pretty sure we didn't do any beam me up, Scotty, and beam me down. I'm pretty sure none of that happened. It was done very much in a three-dimensional physical way uh, that we went to a three-dimensional physical planet. And I, of course, I didn't. I don't remember seeing the planets from the big ship. So that's why I'm saying it kind of almost fits for flat Earth, uh, mini pond theory, as well as globe Earth. Uh, uh, theory very interesting i don't remember so if you had to guess how big would you say the ship was oh probably like new york or los angeles big i'd say more than a million people comfortably live on there so it's the, so it's the size of a large city on earth yeah maybe not as large as some of the Asian cities, but for what we're familiar with, yeah, pretty big. And um, so when I said a while ago, experiences beyond the ship, what I meant, you know, you, you did a great job of answering the question, but it, I was really asking you, after your experiences of three months with the big ship, did you have anything later on that was uh, different than the big ship that, since the big ship? So. Um, not really. I have had a couple of what I'm going to call etheric visits. And, um, and I also, there's another being, and I'm not exactly sure what he is. I don't even know if he's really a he, but um, he, um, I call him a he. He doesn't care. Um, and he actually, I can contact him and he helps boost whatever to help me to go back etherically. So I have gone back etherically, but not a lot. 
And the reason I'm told is because I was given so much information. I'm supposed to write this book. I'm supposed to get the information out. And it's more than enough uh, to handle. Maybe once I've got all of that done, maybe there'll be more. I don't know. But that was my, my purpose uh, in being able to remember was so that I could tell other people. And so I have been back etherically. And that was interesting, too, because when I did go back, that was in 2022, when I did in like January of 2022, when I did go back, what I was really surprised because I was aware that I was not physical, but the other beings were aware that I was there. And I have no idea how that works. So you're saying that um, I if I had to guess, I mean, I'm just trying to piece all this together, but it's a lot. <laughs> tell me, I'm going to guess here what's happening, and then you tell me how far you think I am from the truth. Um, let's say, have you ever been out of your body? Yes. Tell us that experience. Um. I'm trying to think of a specific one. Um, I've how, many time, how many times have you been out of your body? I don't know, but I have many. practiced. Many? Probably. I, I have practiced um, uh, what they call astral traveling and astral projection. So I've done that. And I've also met with a friend of mine. He has no memory of it, but I met with a friend of mine. And we actually uh, were f flying around uh, planet Earth, right? And that happened one time. So I don't know. I don't have a, I don't know. I don't keep track of any of this. It's, I wish I had of. I, w I wish I had a made notes. But to be honest with you, in the beginning, I thought I was dreaming. And then after that, I thought I was crazy. Like, I, d I, I just didn't really realize. And it's only been, you know, even in 2017, when I started talking about what's going on, um, you know, it's it's weird. It's it's so different than here that it makes you kind of wonder how could it how could this even be real, you know? So I don't know how many times I was not big on it. I've just tried uh, doing um, what they call astral projection to leave my body, um, and I used to uh, get freaked out when I would go through the power lines. And my friend of mine, Preston Dennett, he says, no, you don't have to worry about the power lines. So after that, I was able to, um, I don't know, it was weird. It was just like I was afraid of going through power lines. I thought I had to avoid them or something. And then I'd get a little bit stressed and then boom, right back in my body again. So can you tell us uh, more details about one of your out-of-body travels? Yeah, it's not that eventful. Just basically popping out and then being able to fly. So, um, and I know I did it when I was younger because I was aware, I had never seen aerial video and yet I had experienced what it would be like to watch. You know how they have the drones flying over Scotland and stuff like that in videos now? Well, I've had that experience, except I always like to fly close to the ground because I just like to, I don't know, I like the feel of it. So, um, do you understand what the astral plane is? No, I don't get into any of that because um, it's too much detail. I don't know. I don't know. No, I don't. I don't know anything about the that. The reason why I ask is because um, I've listened to people's, you know, even people I knew, like say through an instant messenger application a long time ago. I uh, would get people's before it became public uh, where people like to talk about NDEs and out of body and all that on podcasts long, long before podcasts even existed. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew people who talked about their uh, out of body experiences and they said, well, OK, so I went over to my friend's house and I went into his through his door. And I went into his uh, bedroom or whatever and woke him up and he saw me. So we know 
and the next day after waking up or finishing, you know, I called my friend and he confirmed that he saw me in his place. Right. So we know all that's physical. Right. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting pieces of it is, you know, he describes how as he's going, moving towards his friend's dwelling, he gets to the front door and the front door isn't the way he remembers the front door. It's different. Mm -hmm. So we know that a lot of this, he started physical, he ended physical, he went, he woke the guy up. So we know that part's physical. Okay. But yet the door's different. Therefore, Mm -hmm. we know that the space between where he started and where his friend was, was probably the astral plane. Mm -hmm. Because it's a, the astral plane, as far as I understand it, at least pieces of it, the part that's right around the earth is just a, a memory of the earth, but it's not, you know, it's based, it, it's created from memory, but your memory is mm-hmm. not perfect. Therefore, the the details are not perfect. But when you go out of body, you're really going into the astral plane and coming back and going back and forth between the two. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so, um, well, I haven't I haven't pursued a lot of paranormal stuff. It either just happens or it doesn't. I don't know about the mechanics. I can tell you what happened. I can't necessarily tell you why or how it all happened. But the other thing that's really weird about this is I know I had physicality because I went into the healing chamber. I used the bathroom. That was pretty interesting too. Very different than what we have here. Um, you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have to go to the bathroom. Hold, hold on, I'll stop for a second. There. Stop for a second. Okay, back up. You use the bathroom. Go ahead. Tell us. We want to hear the bathroom experience. Okay. Well, this usually this is where I lose people's uh, uh, attention, but it's just how it was. Okay. So this is when I was during my orientation when I was with my buddy. So. Everything that's in, I don't know if you're familiar with West Coast Native Art, they ha, it's all based on a shape called an ovoid. So the rooms and the hallways and the corridors, everything is like ovoid shape. Nothing is like a square the way we have it on Earth. So we're going down one of these corridors and um, she's taking me to my quarters where I'm going to be sleeping and resting and possibly studying. Um, and what happens is everything in the ship I don't know if it's nanotechnology or what, but you can go anywhere and it can become what you need it to to become. So the ship is also telepathic. So all of a sudden, just this sort of doorway opens that wasn't, couldn't even tell there was a doorway there. We go inside and I'm thinking, wow, this is interesting. And she um, um, gestures to the wall and out comes this platform very close to the floor and on it just appears not like magic but somehow it just assembles uh without it being pixelated or anything like that and there was my bed and she just motioned to it and i lay down on there and it was pretty comfy and i thought this is cool and then i had to go to the bathroom and she knew that i had to go to the bathroom we weren't there's no talking and she just motioned to another place and this sort of doorway opened up and I went inside and it closed behind me and a little platform came out from the base of the wall and from that platform came up like a tube I'd say it's like about oval and about maybe this big around right this tube and it's kind of corrugated um, uh, with like folds in it just comes up from the floor and that's where you go to the bathroom. And um, depending on what you want to do, it just, just facilitates it. And then afterwards, when you're done, it was like there was a little poof of air. And whatever is in that air just cleans you up. So you don't use toilet paper or anything like that. And then afterwards, it just goes back into the back into the floor. And, and, and what's interesting is even the housekeeping is interesting because there's kind of like... Um, 
a mist, a very fine mist. You don't even, you notice it at first, but after a while you don't notice it all. And it's in the corridors, it's in the rooms, it's everywhere. And then there's also um, a ventilation system. And what this does is it traps odors and anything like that. I don't know, dead skin cells, whatever I'm guessing here. And it just uh, vacuums it all very gently away into the system. And um, so I don't know if, if the, I call it a toilet, it's not a toilet, you know, operates on the same system or not, but I thought it was pretty, pretty nice and it made the whole procedure very um, easy and no problem. And um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's what the bathroom was like. So I used the bathroom, so I can't explain that either. But I do know that they have a cl they have clones that you can use as well. So you might be at home and you can operate a clone. And they have three different kinds of clones. They have the kind of one size fits all. And you can tell people apart because of their mannerisms and the way they walk and all that kind of stuff. But essentially, it's just one kind of clone, like a body. I'm calling it a clone. I don't know what it is. I'm just calling it that so that people can get an idea. It's a physical structure that we can inhabit in order to get around and experience physicality. But I'm pretty sure I was there as me, especially during the orientation. Another kind of clone that they have is a utilitarian one, where it's actually like, um, well, not exactly like Transformers, but it's basically a body that has whatever equipment you're going to need to do specific tasks built right into it and that was pretty interesting too and then there are another kind of clone where it's an actual bioidentical body to what you have on earth except it's a hell of a lot healthier and um there's that too so sometimes i don't remember exactly how things went i just remember specific information i don't know if that helps or answers your question well okay so i'm gonna go back to the um the astral question. Okay, so I, I have this theory that about what happened to you, and and maybe you can explain whether you believe it's correct or totally, totally off. So what I think it happened was they took your astral body, took you to the astral plane, but you're not your physical body is still on Earth. Then they put your astral body, they either, they either, um, okay, so how does this go? So the, I've taken people between lifetimes, and right after they died, they're, I don't know if they're in the astral plane, but they're somewhere not too far away in another reality, and they can manifest physical space and have themselves be physical, even though their body is no more. They've already died, right? So I'm guessing that the astral plane is just as physical as this one, even though it may be based on memories, it's still a physical space. And so when they took your astral body there, then it either becomes physical by itself or they give you the vessels to put it in so that you feel as physical as you are now. Either way, that that ship might exist in the what we consider the physical plane or the, the universe, or it might exist on the astral plane, or it might exist on a plane above that, that, that I know that very few people talk about you know, people talk about the Earth plane and then they talk about the astral plane around that, but very few people talk about the other planes that are above those, which there are many. It could exist in any number of those planes. And so that would, uh, that possibility would facilitate it, the craft being able to move anywhere without moving, because if you go up high enough above the, you know, planes, different planes up, you really are everywhere at once. You're just, you know, where do you choose to be? And then you kind of drop down in vibration and you're back in the astral plane or whatever plane you were. You know, you're not moving lateral. You're just moving like up and down maybe 
in vibration, yeah. but not even physically. So I'm trying to wrap my mind around all of this. And that's what I've given you is the closest thing I can give you to uh, my rationalization. Uh, how do you feel how close I am or how far uh, how far do you think I am from, you know, that I'm totally <laughs> off or maybe or is it a flip of a coin or what? Um, I don't know. I, I'm so sorry. I really don't know. The other thing, too, is I would go to bed at night in my bed and wake up in my bed. I don't know if I was taken physically, etherically. Like, I don't know how this works. I'm as surprised as anybody that I had this experience. Um, and so I don't know. What you're saying sort of fits with that Venn diagram that I was showing on that other show. So maybe you're right. I don't know. But I do know that I experienced definite physicality when I was on, on going through the orientation, when I spent a great deal of time on the big ship, when I was doing the exopolitical work. But when I'm doing the exopolitical work in the meetings, that was definitely etheric. So I don't know. I honestly don't know. I wish I could just lay it all out for you like a slice of loaf of bread, but I don't know. It's well, I, this I is think, why for a while I thought I was just crazy. I think uh, people have a hard time believing that the afterlife is as physical as the as the as our physical life, and then you hear about well, a lot of people who uh, die and they don't realize they're dead, and obviously they don't realize they're dead because they're experiencing their world just as physical as this one is. That's well, I think I think you're absolutely right because on another occasion, this is totally separate from my ET experience. I was told, and this is uh, what I consider my angelic guides. I was told that when we pass on to the next realm, it's it seems almost exactly like here. Well, of course, there isn't as much BS, but like for instance, instead of the plants needing water and nutrition from the earth, everything is more energetic. And so the plants are energetic and they just there's a flow of energy around everything. And so it doesn't work exactly the same, but in essence, it feels the same. Because I can remember um I was saying to them, you know, I'm really gonna miss the the the, the feel of the wind in my hair. I'm really going to miss the chirping of the birds. You know, that's my own, like, I'm not afraid to die, but this is, this is what I'm going to miss about being alive on planet earth. And they said, Oh no, you're going to have all of that, all of that, the next realm. It just operates slightly different. It's more of a flow of energy that feeds everything rather than a three dimensional, you need water H2O and you need these chemicals in the soil and minerals. So I would, I would say, I would agree with you is what I'm, I guess I'm saying. Well, um, I um, was interviewing somebody the other day, yesterday, the day before, and uh, I, I had a thought, but it, it escapes me. Um, the afterlife, physicality. Uh, yeah, uh, did you ever... You know who Robert Monroe is, right? No. Is that from the Monroe Institute? Yes, that's Robert Monroe. Okay, no, I know very little ab about it. I know about the Hemi Sync, um, you know, that you listen to with headphones. I know that they teach people how to bend spoons and make wheat grow out of their hands instantly, but that's all I know. Well, one of the things, he he, he would use his Hemi Sync... Uh, do you know what hemispheric synchronization is? I, I just think it synchronizes your left and your right brain. But and do you know how? Do you know how it does it? Um, just with tones and. Well, music. what it, what it does yeah. is you play one frequency in one ear, you play a, another frequency, a different frequency in the other ear, and the two halves of your brain entrain to the difference in the two frequencies. Is let's say you had 50 hertz in one ear and 30 hertz in the other ear, your brain's going to entrain to 20 hertz, the difference between the two. So that's how it works. But he didn't invent it, but um, I've heard the name of the guy who invented it, but I don't remember his name. Anyway, uh, one of things Robert Monroe, the only reason I bring it up is one of the things Robert Monroe mentioned was he said that when you're, when you're in these realities beyond the physical, that you can create your physical world 
just like my clients said that they did their physical worlds in between lives when they're on the other side. The same, they're verifying each other's information. You're, you might be beyond the physical, well, we consider the physical world, but it's still just as physical. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, <coughs> is there any particular, uh, whoa, that was a glitch. Yeah, I don't know what happened. That was a network, that was a network glitch between uh. the two. So is there anything between uh, or anything uh, either very unique on the ship that you did or is there anything else in your experiences overall that you uh, draws your mind to speak about it at this moment? Mm. Not really. Um, like I said, the food grows live and in every department. And there is, um, it's um, hydroponic. There's a fluid that runs along the walls and sustains the plants. But also uh, people actually talk to the plants and love the plants and love the food. And um, the ship itself, it, like I said, it's alive. And so there are times where the beings on the ship would give love and affection to the to the ship. When I first arrived in orientation, I, I, I wondered what the walls were made out of. It looked like some really beautiful um, finished leather, you know, it was very soft. And I ran my finger down and there was little ripples on, e on either side uh, as a physical response to my touch. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I don't know. There's probably quite a few things I can say. I'm starting to get tired. And um, so, so uh, if you had to guess, how many different types of beings would you say ballpark were on the ship? Thousands, thousands. And then the other thing, too, is um, births are not regulated, but they are documented. So anyone can find out what they're genealogy is and so you also have beings coming from diverse um origins that also form um you know become mates and have children too so like for instance the um the gal that uh was my buddy she her her many generations ago they lived on a planet and they actually uh were sustained by this nectar that was in these big like flowers and so she had a narrower jaw and an extra long tongue, which I thought was kind of interesting. It wasn't like freakishly different, but um, um, but then, you know, that's just her genetics from way back. She didn't need to eat that way anymore. Um, there, you know, um, there was there was describe, some that, describe her uh, in more detail. Well, she was very tall, like about six, four, because um, my shoulder just kind of came up to, I, I guess, maybe her chest. So she was quite a bit taller than me. Um, she had very vibrant orangey red hair. And I don't know if you've seen those guinea pigs where they're all covered in little cowlicks and little spirals the way their hair grows. Her hair grew very much like that as well. And um, she was pale skinned. They tend to try to match us with beings that look sort of similar to us. And um, she was just really fit. She had a larger, much larger frame than me. And she just wore basically like an orange poncho. Uh, some are more into clothing than others. Some hardly wear any at all. And uh, it, it's all different. So much diversity, so much diversity. But that's you, basically what she looked like. Did you see any beings that were like the ones that people typically talk about on Earth, like reptilians or greys or? Uh, no. There wasn't any beings that, you know, the people, that, the types of beings that people talk about. Yeah, no. Nope. You didn't see any of those kind of beings on nope, the show? No, nothing like that. Although one time when I was doing the exopolitical work where we were in a meeting, there was like a a holographic representation of some of the beings that they claim visit Earth. 
And I was actually surprised because like when I, um, I have never met or seen, you know, reptilians or anything like that, but the way they're described on earth is kind of very sort of fear m making you afraid and, and they, they look kind of hideous and subhuman in some way. Well, first of all, we were all created, we didn't evolve. So for beings to evolve out of a dinosaurs or lizards, or I don't know about that. I only know in my experience that we were uh, that I was taught that we were created, which resonates with me. But anyway, I got to see the likeness of some of these beings. I was actually very surprised because they were very regal, much the way, you know, if you ha uh, had a king or a queen, maybe not today, but 100, 200, 300 years ago, you know, with the with the rich garments and the fabrics, and, and uh, they were beautiful, but the, more than just the way they looked, the way they held themselves, they were very regal, very intelligent, and they felt that it was time for me to um, just see these likenesses to get a better perspective on what these beings are like, because a lot of the folklore uh, and mythology on Earth, you know, paints a pretty negative picture of them. So that was the closest I ever got, and that only happened once that I can remember. But no, on the big ship, no. Um, I, I think one of the weird, well, I wouldn't say weird, but sort of weirder, um, some of the beings have sensors in their skin, and they can actually do camouflage, which I thought was really interesting. But these same beings wear very bright patterned clothing and you can always see a, a hint of the pattern on their skin. I never saw them try to deceive anybody or hide or blend in. I never saw them actually do that. They may have had the capability at one time. I don't know if they still do. And then another uh, sort of a, um, difference than, than what you would see on than Earth people is, like I said, the skin tones are a little bit different. Some had more orange highlights. Some had a little bit more teal. But... Basically, we would consider most of them as being like people of color, all different, you know, shades of of browns and that kind of thing. And then there was one um, one couple I met and they had kids. And it was really interesting because their emotions would show up in like blotches, like pigment on their skin. And so if they're getting, you know, want their kids to come right now, the kids could tell by the some of the pigment orientation on their on their parents face i thought that was pretty interesting too but that's about as wild as it gets everybody was just super healthy most are taller than us much uh much larger frames very muscular very very healthy there's no concept for sickness or anything like that and the other thing i want to mention is procreation only happens within the first hundred years and I would say about the average lifespan is about 500 years. So in the first 100 years, you know, they go through their thing where they procreate or they have mates and they do have sexuality at that point. But after that, they sort of become very different. They become like elders and um, wisdom keepers. And then when they're tired of, of living because they're super healthy, then when it's time for them to pass on to another realm or whatever you want to call it, they don't recognize death the way we do here as some big final thing. Then there's actually ceremony around the time of their passing and they choose when they want to pass and it's celebrated. But I would say the average lifespan is about 500 years, a lot longer than what we have here. But I've been taught that we could be more like them if we had a biologically appropriate diet, environment, you know, uh, we don't realize how badly toxified uh, we are in, in, in today's day and age and how sick we are. This is not how we were meant to be. So you're familiar with the, um, the mythology or the beliefs surrounding the Pleiadians, yes? No, I don't study any other, any other. I have my own experience, it's enough. I don't study, I don't watch a lot of stuff by other people. I have a few friends like, you know, Dolly Safran. I've had her on my um, angel, um, Aliens and Angels show. Her experience is completely different than mine. 
Um, I've had Lala Bright on, her experience is completely different. What I'm seeing is possibly we are interfacing with different realms or different dimensional realities. So I don't see any of them as being wrong, but I don't, you know, I don't watch a bunch of videos of people talking about their experiences because I don't relate to them. They don't resonate with me. It's, I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying I have enough of my own experience to unpack and present without, um, you know, uh, you know, plus I have a whole life outside of this. If you go to my website, I don't even talk about my ET experiences unless you're watching one of my videos. You know, I'm out in the garden and, and doing life, you know, I'm not, it's not my main focus in life. It's just a piece of who I am and what I do. Well, the only reason I brought it up was because um, the way you described a lot of the creatures on the ship, it sounded like you were describing Pleiadians, which is basically a lot of people, or not a lot of people. Some people believe they're cloned because they're too perfect. They're blonde, blue-eyed, uh, perfect physique, um, and you know the women are gorgeous, the men are stunning. They're all they sort of remind me of your description of. A lot of the creatures on the ship and that makes me wonder if there's any connection not that i don't there know is, but just, i never heard the term palladian i never heard anyone i they don't even identify they're just they're just beings they're just sure living beings they, they're not caught up in all of that um you know and i don't know but i gotta tell you the white skinned with hair like mine that's pretty rare I did see, you know, a few, but it was interesting. I call them angelics. They, they're not angels, but because of the, you know, the way our earth mythology portrays holy beings often as having, you know, white hair and, you know, and they were pretty beautiful, but they really stuck to themselves. I did not have any interaction with them. I stared at them a bit. It was a bit embarrassing because that's kind of rude on every in every culture, but I just couldn't help myself because they were very beautiful. But I, they may have been, I don't know, but they never identified themselves as such. So I don't know. So you said um, it took, how, lo how long was it in your in earth time and how long was it in their time again? It was about, it was three months in of earth time. Right. And it was more like, I'm just guessing, three and a half years of being away. So, for instance, when I went to the orientation, I was really concerned because I've got, you know, I had a kitty that needed to be fed and looked after. And I had, you know, I didn't tell anyone I was going anywhere. I didn't know I'd be going anywhere, you know. And she, uh, my buddy assured me that um, that when the time came for me to go home, it would be like one night. And so uh, that's why I have my memories are much larger in scope than what's possible in one night or even in three months. Well, they say that um, in the afterlife, there's no such thing as time. So you can be, you can like have a near death experience if you're, if you go onto the other side completely within your near death experience, it's literally only a day or or less than a week that you're over there but your time over there could be a yeah. very long time because that's how it was there's no time and so that makes me think that it is it's uh a strong possibility that you're as you're as where you were on the ship is a space that's beyond the physical plane that we know of not i'm not saying it's not physical i'm just saying it's beyond this plane the what we consider. I, I would I would agree. I, I and there was aspects of it that were, had physicality and parts of it that that not so much. So I don't know. I don't I don't know everything, and I don't remember everything. But I do remember quite a lot, and um, and that's what I, I bring to the show today. Well, um, is is there anything you want to uh, tell that you're doing now, or that? You know, uh, I know I know you have an Angels and Aliens podcast. Yeah. What's the name of your other podcast? The other one is called the Quantum Guide Show. And the Quantum Guide Show, I, I'm the host and I interview people. 
And what they all have in common, they don't have a lot in common, but what they have in common is they've woken up and they realize the system we're living in is not what they thought it was, is not what we've been taught. And you go through a bit of shock and awe waking up, you know, to see this. And instead of them offing themselves or getting depressed or angry, they've created something that they're bringing to the world. So it could be music, it could be research, it could be arcane or, not, or forbidden knowledge, it could be anything. Um, and, and, and I just have them on my show and we just talk about them. Maybe they wrote a book, maybe they're into astrology, um, whatever, but they're bringing something, you know, good to, to the people. And so they get a voice on my show that gets it out there so that other people can be encouraged the Aliens and Angels podcast is only people who have had either angelic, ET, or something in that genre um, experience. And we talk about our experiences. And there's no competition. Um, you know, we're grown ups. We can talk about our experiences. They could be vastly different, and that's okay. But these are people that I feel have legitimate, and I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that um, other people aren't having legitimate experiences, but, you know, with the whole, I don't know, there's been so much exposure lately of people that have come forward and said they made it all up and all these other stories that are sort of all using that experience as a foundation. You don't know what to believe anymore. So I'm trying to have people who've had, as 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 far as I can discern, authentic experiences and then we just talk about it in a very uh, informal, friendly way. And I enjoy it very much. Um, and then I'm sure. working on my book. Um, and um, I don't know when that will be out, hopefully soon. So a couple things mentioned in your bio is uh, shamanic guidance and uh, ascension counseling. So do you want to say anything uh, sure. about what you do in those areas? Sure. Well, I actually have a degree in social work and um, which helped prepare me uh, because I specialized actually in uh, addictions and also in family counseling. So I can and because I have such a weird and wonderful life, people can contact me and get support regardless of where they're coming from. But, you know, if they've got, you know, they can't they feel that they can't talk about it and be taken seriously by mainstream counselors then then i'm a good choice for them um so that because i can listen to them and they can feel heard and supported um i don't believe in going to experts and that includes me i believe the powers within every individual to know what's right for them to, to their path to healing is unique to them so what i do is i don't tell them how to do stuff i support them in their and their journey of self-discovery. And the shamanic uh, can include anything. Like if somebody's having a problem and they've tried mainstream and they've tried everything else and they're still having problems, I can consult with my guides for information or input or um, something that helps them. And then I can also recommend, you know, um, I don't know, a plethora of different healing modalities, alternative healing modalities that they might want to check out. And my goal is not to have someone that has to keep coming to see me over and over again. I hope to be able to give people um, the belief in themselves and, and belief in their own abilities so that they don't have to come back and see me over and over again. They can just sort of get some on track and they feel more confident and away they go. So... I noticed I was uh, scanning through your videos in your in your YouTube channel, one of your one of your YouTube channels, and I did see the part where you had the you had mentioned it before the six or seven or how many steps it is. Uh, Nine steps to quantum health transformation. Yeah, why don't you um, considering that you obviously feel that that's an important thing. Can you speak a little bit about it? Sure, I'll give you a brief overview. It's it's. Uh, I was just kind of given the information all at once. It was a lot. It was very overwhelming. And then I basically broke it down into nine steps. And um, and 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 the weird thing about it is you start at step nine and you work your way to step one. I don't know why I did it that way. It's just how I did it. 
And um, so the first three steps are steps nine, eight, and seven. And they're all about waking up to um, the bigger picture. They're, they're about expanding your mind so that you can be open to your own paranormal experiences, so that you can be open to living your life in a different way. So step nine helps you to uh, new, new ways of thinking that are not binary, this or that, or up or down, or black and white, and how we can escape that whole binary way of thinking. Step eight is about all kinds of technologies that maybe we don't even consider as technologies, like just grounding out on the grass is a technology. We've got all kinds of technologies that surround us. Um, and then step seven, oh, I just want to say step nine is also about light shadow work. So we got to integrate Everyone wants to be all walking in the light and love all the time, but we all got a shadow. We all do. And until we reconcile, uh, recognize our shadow and reconcile the two, you know, we're not really functioning at our full capacity. And step seven does a similar thing, but it's with our male and female energies, your yin and yang. So the left side of your body, your energy flow is, is considered feminine and the right side is considered ma uh, masculine. And how we can actually... Um, combine aspects of what we traditionally maybe think of being male. And I, I give you an example. I was raised in a family where women are supposed to be quiet and small. Well, I'm neither quiet nor small, and that's okay. You know, only men were supposed to be like that. So I can incorporate different traits um, uh, to help to help me get the most out of my life and to be the person I want to be. So that's the first three steps. Then there's the middle three steps. They're all about detoxification how to detoxify physically, what products we may be using in our home that are actually very toxic and they're poisoning us and making us sick that we don't know. And we keep going to the doctor for pills and here is our cleaning products or our shampoo. Helps helps you to get oriented to how to, what's toxic, what's not and what we can do about it. And then um, also how to detoxify our emotions. All of our emotions are good and they're all meant to serve us. And then we need to con, uh, detoxify um, internally by taking a look at what we're eating. You know, a lot of people are not even aware of what a biologically appropriate diet might look like. And I don't tell people you got to eat this way, you got to be eat that way. That's up to people. But it, if it's real food, it's important. And then how to detoxify from the construct, how to detoxify our minds from this conditioning that we've been born and raised in way, way that the mainstream um, operates. And then once we've done all that, now we're ready for the last three steps and they help us to do all kinds of things like how to manifest and bring more of what you want into your life, um, how to create a framework uh, for our spirituality. So we can actually create our own framework of whether we want it to be angels or whether we want it to be God and, and Christ or what, what doesn't matter, whatever your framework that you resonate with that helps you to make spiritual contact and then the very last lesson is on how to well, create basically miracles by learning what is love, what are the components, what can we be practicing every day in our own lives. This is very non-religious. Um, <clears throat> things like patience, things like self-control, um, <clears throat> things like kindness, you know, random acts of kindness, things that we can be doing in our own lives. And it's miraculous how it seems to open up opportunities that we never dream possible and so that's what the quantum health transformation program you start by expanding your mind then detoxifying because then you can hold the frequency this is our temple body you know we need to be able to hold the frequency so we can make contact <coughs> excuse me and then spiritual exercises on help helping us to get oriented and build a framework and so that's the program it's absolutely free. Um, you can find it on my website. It's www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com. And uh, I also have a shop if people want to support my work because it's a lot of expenses to maintaining a website, Zoom, uh, just on and on and on and on, right? It helped me out, but I'm not charging for it. You can buy the PDFs of each lesson they're three dollars and ninety nine cents, which is in Canadian is like two dollars and fifty cents American. So I've kept it very, very low. And that helps me with some of my expenses. But the basic program is all there and absolutely free.
and I'm also available to do some coaching. If people want to sign up for coaching, they can do that through my shop as well. So before before you had the um, three months of big ship experience, was there anything um, that you did in your life that you think might have prepared you f or caused you to have that experience, those experiences? Well, I would say the angelic uh, experience because it opened my mind. But at the same time, I cannot say I'm some kind of special person. I'm not the grand poobah of these people. I don't represent them in any way. This is just me talking about my experience the best way I understand it and can communicate it to other people. But no, I wasn't on any kind of a big quest to learn about ETs or, I mean, I've always been interested. But um, um, no, well, not really. I was, I was thinking you might have been like uh, done some energy work or uh, meditation or any number of spiritual practices. Oh, that um, actually, um, there is one thing I should admit, and that was after the angelic experience and before the extraterrestrial experience, I met a woman and she was studying. She was part of that group that hangs out with Ashiana Deanne. Ashiana Deanne wrote the Voyager uh, Voyager books uh, all about. But I, I didn't relate to the books because it was too complicated. But my friend shared with me some guided meditations that Ashiana Deanne had created that are supposed to facilitate um, some kind of spiritual awakening. So I did do, um, I don't know, probably a dozen of these guided meditations, which may have opened me up for the experience. I don't know. I'm just going to admit that I did do that. And then, of course, I was practicing meditation. I was uh, very much gravitating towards a biologically appropriate diet. I was working on my relationships with other people, you know, to remove... Um, let's just say toxic people from my life, bringing more peace into my life. You know, I had a sincere desire to be, I knew that as a human being, I could be better and we could all be better. I'm not saying everyone has to do it my way, but I was sincerely working on that. But I'd had an angelic experience. After that, it changes you, changes you completely. Did more for me than all those years of religion, for sure. I'm not saying religion's bad. If it works for you, great, but it just so, doesn't work for me. The Voyager series of books, I've never heard of that. What is the experience? Oh, it's, yeah, to me, I'm just going to be honest, and, and, and I'm not an expert, so please don't, you know, take me too seriously here. But I find I found the books really crazy-making because it's all um, all these complicated names she gives to everything. I couldn't get past all the complicated names for everything. And she's talking about these wars in heaven and all this stuff. And I just couldn't relate to it. I just found it basically put me to sleep. And I didn't understand what she was actually trying to say. It was not written in ordinary language. It was written in very complex technical terms that I don't think anybody could understand. Some people love her books, but I, I I bought them, but I could not relate to them at all. So before you before you had your um, angelic experience, you were very uh, not really wanting to be here on Earth, correct? Yes, at that particular time, yeah, that's what seemed to bring it about. I was like wanting to uh, just just fed up with the BS on earth and all the troubles I'd had and, you know, just had so, enough. So do you think they, the angels came along because, um, because they have a vested interest in you remaining here for a period to do whatever you're here to do instead of offing yourself? Well, yes, but they gave me a choice. I could off myself if I wanted to, but I didn't really want to off myself. I just wanted a different life. And so what I did after that is I renewed for another 42 years. So as, way I, as far as I'm concerned, when I'm 84, I can then choose another 42 years or I can decide to go or whatever I want. Like we have tremendous free will. Nobody's going to make us do anything 
uh, we don't want to do. So I didn't really want to die. I really, really wanted to have a better life. And it didn't happen right away. Oh, my goodness. But the life I have now is so incredibly good and peaceful and with good community and friends and just I have such a lovely life. <clears throat> so is there anything you want to uh, last? I figure we probably said most of what we need to yeah. say. Uh, but um, yeah, I want to encourage people. I want to encourage people to actually not believe me. It's better if they don't believe me. I'm not trying to convince anyone to believe me. I'm saying this is what's possible in the human experience. Go out and find your own. Be open to it. It's it's incredible what we can experience if we just open our minds. You know, that's what that's the only thing I want to say. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm glad that you shared your experiences through my show. I wish you the best of luck in all your efforts, and I uh, hope we uh, both show up together on the big ship someday. Well, you never know. Maybe <laughs> we even already have. You never know. So anyway, I wish you the very best, and thank you. And thank you, everybody, for listening. I really appreciate it. Take care. Uh,